Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Hey, this is Colin Hegna from Federale and BJM, and you are listening to Concerts That Made Us. Oh, 
Colin, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Hello, how's it going? First and foremost, Federale recently released the sixth studio album, Reverb and Seduction. It's your most varied album to date. Take us a bit deeper into it if you can. Yeah, well, I was sort of trying to expand the palette of what we were doing a little bit. And uh, as a result, I brought in a lot more influences from different places than I had in the past. Um, and that just kind of made it more varied and, uh, you know, had a wider range of influences, I guess you could say. I getcha. I getcha. Tell us a bit about the dynamic within the band when it comes to making new music. What does it look like? Well, you know, I actually had a bit of a um, personnel turnover um, about halfway through the record. Um, so the dynamic shifted there because I've been working with the folks that I've been working with previously for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of the stuff was done during, you know, the pandemic. So there's a lot of changes were forced upon everyone. <laughs> um, so, you know, a, a good chunk of the record was done sort of remotely and with uh, different people um, that I could work with, you know, remotely. Um, and then the other half of the record was made with the new group of folks who I've been playing with. And that was more of like a traditional recording setting where we, you know, I brought songs to the table and then we sort of fleshed out the arrangements um, in the studio together, um, as opposed to it being constructed sort of piece by piece. You mentioned recording. Was there any challenges or maybe memorable moments that you can share with us during recording production? Well, yeah, I mean, it was just difficult. Um, so, like I said, a lot of it was done during or half of it was done during the pandemic. So um, it was just a challenge of like trying to, you know, have any sort of creative uh, relationship with folks um, when you're not in the same space. Um, so just trying to find a way to make it work, you know, working with drummers remotely, working with string players remotely. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, you sort of had to like um, find new ways of working. And I found that really, at first I found it difficult, but then I sort of got into it and I really enjoyed it. Um, but then the, like I said, the other half of the record was done in a more traditional style, just everybody in the same room. And that was really great because you could really feel the energy, you know, of people playing off of each other that way. And I, I really prefer to work that way if possible. So, um, you know, you could tell when things are working immediately in that, in that way of working. Very true. Very true. Now, something that always intrigues me, the original vision for this album, how close yeah. do you think the final version is? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, sometimes things take on a life of their own and you have to kind of follow them where they take you. Uh, so, you know, I, as much as I try to like have a complete vision of where I want it to wind up and then actually get it to that version that I have in my head, sometimes things pop up and you have to follow them, you know, like something interesting happens and it's not something that you would have planned. So, uh, you know, you have to follow those things, whatever the best idea is that pops up. Um, it's just a matter of being flexible and recognizing when accidents happen that are for, you know, for the, for the betterment of the entire whole. Uh, so I'd say, you know, as much as I try, it's pretty close, but there's, there's a lot of things that kind of pushed it in new directions. So, you know, it, it definitely didn't turn out exactly the way it was, I wanted, but I am very happy with it. <laughs> good, good. Is there, a, is there a track on the album that, you know, speaks to you more than the others? Is there one that you gravitate more towards? Well, I would say probably uh, Heaven Forgive Me um, because it, I, I, I was really trying to go after a couple um, influences of mine that I never really never really tried to go after um and i feel like that song really works um i think sonically it's interesting um and it's got you know a, a good pop sort of structure to it you know which is something that i don't generally do um but i feel like it works really well and i'm just happy that that song comes across as as well as it does is that something we can expect more of going into the future I'd say so. Um, I have, you know, seven songs recorded for the next record at this point. Um, so it's, it's almost done. 
Um, and I can say it definitely is headed in that direction a bit. Um, yeah, I'm trying to embrace more of like the traditional song structure a bit. Um, and, you know, like just trying different things because a lot of my stuff that I've done in the past has been sort of trying to not be traditional. Uh, so I've been enjoying trying to do things in a more sort of like uh, how you would expect things to go way. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of not being traditional, Federali, what inspired you to create a spaghetti western themed psychedelic rock band? It's not something you hear <laughs> of every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was it was kind of on a whim. Um, you know, I, I started this with a friend of mine, uh, Ryan Sumner. He kind of kind of had the general idea of it. Uh, one day we were just watching uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we were just so taken by the music, which of course is amazing. Ennio Morricone, his his music is fascinating and and just brilliant. Um, and so you know we were like kind of hung over in, in our twenties and foolishly thought, well, we could do something like that. No one else is doing anything like that. Um, so then we set about trying to do it, and of course it's more difficult than you would have thought. Um, but it was just basically on a whim, just because we loved that kind of music and we loved like the emotions that it would bring forward um you know there's sort of like a a feeling of badassness you know to a lot of those scores very true very true yeah, yeah. and you're you're also the longtime bassist with the brian jonestown massacre how has that impacted federally well federally has opened up for bjm several times over the years um and that's been really great anton who's the leader of bjm he has been really supportive of my endeavors in general and i'm really appreciative of that um you know and stylistically i played with that band for 20 plus years on and off and so i've definitely have like gleaned a lot of like stylistic stuff uh from doing that as well as just you know like how to approach music and then how to approach you know having a band as well so it's definitely been a big influence but i'd say like as far as stylistically, this record is the first time that I've really allowed like the BJM style to creep into Federale a bit. It's definitely in there this, with this one. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of tell it all right. Also, i seen uh, that BJM are coming to Ireland in February, I think. Can we expect maybe Federale to open for them then? <laughs> no, no, I'm afraid not. But um, we do have our very first uh, European tour starting um, on actually on Halloween of this year so we'll be in in europe and but not the uk hopefully the uk at some point soon hopefully hopefully now before we move on i it's an irish podcast so i feel like i'm obligated to mention you also compose music for film and you worked on the banshees of inish aaron well if if i'm to be honest i didn't i didn't write that music specifically for that 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 was a federale track that um i i was approached by the production um, because they wanted to use that song for their trailer. Um, so the song was already written and it it didn't have anything to do with the film when I was writing it, unfortunately, although I, I really wish I would have had the opportunity to do that. Um, but it did work really well. Um, and I think it was an interesting choice on their part because, you know, one could have obviously done something that was sounded a, a lot more, you know, Irish because uh, it's such a Irish themed film. Um, but I, I think it turned out really, really cool. I certainly did. I certainly did. Now, the podcast is called Concerts That Made Us, so I have to ask you some concert-related questions, if you don't mind. Sure. First off, as a concert goer, what concerts would you say have made you? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I saw I saw Tom Waits um, in, like, 1999. Um and it was absolutely fantastic. It was uh, it was the first time that I'd really seen like someone really bring a lot of theatrics into like a rock band uh, scenario. It's not a traditional rock band, but you know, you know what I mean. And um, it was really striking. Um, and I was I was really inspired by that particular concert. I've taken that with me um always and then uh, more more recently i saw um the band uh smile and uh in portland and they were absolutely incredible it was a uh, striking performance like really uh there's a lot of uh improvisation 
um, a lot of stuff that was very non-traditional, but still accessible. And I just thought the sheer amount of like imagination and, and talent and creativity that was coming off the stage of just those three guys was incredible. Yeah, yeah. Is there a, a show you went to that maybe fans of yours would be a bit surprised that you're into? <laughs> um, yeah, several. Um, I, I've seen Rammstein three times. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think they're really incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not really my kind of music, but it's really over the top and it's just like quite the spectacle. Yeah, so, without that's... doubt. <laughs> I like one. it. <laughs> <laughs> and for any listeners that haven't been lucky enough to catch one of Federale's shows, what are they like? Give us the full experience if you can. Well, I try to have a little bit of a theatrical experience. Um, you know, I try to have like an arc over the course of the show. Um, you know, and oftentimes I actually um, coordinate with um, lighting designers to have like uh, sort of like a set design of just lights that evolve over the course of time to kind of have like a story arc. So there's there's a bit of drama there and there's a bit of drama in the music as well. Um, I try to have, you know, a little bit of theatrical aspects to it, um, not going into like full opera territory or anything like that. But, you know, I like to be inspired by stuff like that and remember that it is you know there's people sitting there staring at you so you know sure i can sit and play my guitar but everybody can do that so i try to make it a bit more theatrical and a bit more of you know large gestures and stuff like that it's very it's very sort of like borders on classical music at times i'd say i like it i like it for the shows that you open for bjm how do you approach that because that's you know that's almost double the work yeah <laughs> well you know it's uh, I, I play guitar in federale so it's a, it's a different thing i play bass in the brian jonestown massacre um and you know when i'm playing the bass with anton i'm i have a very lip you know my role is very limited um comparatively um i i love doing it of course um but yeah it's just kind of like a different set of skills that i'm using Similar skills, but a different set. So it's like change hats, basically. I getcha. I getcha. Now, if you think of all the shows that you've played over your entire career, yeah. is there one that sits above the rest? You know, it just couldn't have got any better. Ooh, goodness. That's a tough one. Um, I, I remember the first time that BJM played in Italy. We played in this tiny little villa um in the middle of this tiny little town that i'd never heard of and it seemed like everybody from the town came just because it was a music event i don't think they're necessarily like brian jonestown fans or anything like that and anyhow we were playing and we were, we were playing this one song um it's called lantern and like the entire i felt like the entire city was singing along with us with this like wordless melody that repeats over and over and it was really incredible like it really brought me to you know almost to tears like i was really moving because you know to have the entire community respond to, to your music and sing along with you in that way as they're participating in it you know it was really really striking and uh, i'll always remember that show that's probably one of my favorite shows i ever played Oh man, oh man, it's going to be hard to beat that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Here's a, a bit of a fun one. Out of all the gigs you've played, is there one you would consider the worst? You know, everything went wrong, and how did you overcome it? <laughs> um, there's been a lot. There's been a lot <laughs> of those. Um, just you know, I mean, BJM's a volatile band, um, and you know, there's been a couple shows where it was just an absolute train wreck, and I was just. Uh, hoping that we could just call it and then leave. <laughs> there, there have been a couple times when we, when we actually did stop playing before intending to. Um, there was one uh, that we played in San Francisco that was just uh, it was a total train wreck. It was one of the worst shows I've ever been a part of. Um, and yeah, I think the venue threatened to um, threatened to not pay us because we didn't play long enough. And when we did play, it was really bad. Um, so that's probably the one for me. That was at uh, Slim's, I believe. Oh, man. <laughs> Jeez. 
Yeah. And uh, when when it comes to show time, then what's your pre-show and your post show? How do you psych yourself up, and then afterwards, how do you like to wind down? Well, um, it's weird because I this happens to a lot of people I've noticed, but I get really tired right before going on. I get this like wave of tiredness, and you have to kind of fight against it, you know. So oftentimes, I'll actually like walk like walk around, sort of like jumping and like moving my arms and stuff, just to get my like blood flowing and stuff um kind of like almost like an athlete you know does um just trying to get psyched up and like get your physical body like awake and and moving so um there's that i i usually do that before we play um and then afterwards you know i just you know i like to chill out and start drinking with my friends <laughs> sounds good <laughs> clocked out i'm clocked out i'm gonna have some drinks you know <laughs> I like it. I like it. Is there, you know, speaking of fans and followers, is there any kind of fan interactions that always stick with you to this day? Hmm. Well, you know, for the most part, people are really great. Um, you know, I've met a lot of really wonderful folks who were originally just people who were fans coming to the shows and stuff. And I, you know, I have a couple friends, I would say, that I've met just through this, you know? Um, so people that'll be my lifelong friends, you know, um, that were originally just fans coming to a show. Um, so that's been really great. You know, there's always some folks that can be annoying and it's, you know, people can be really annoying around, around the BJM because there's, you know, they, they want to like wind, wind us up, you know? Mm. Um, so that can be a thing, but I'd say that's, you know, the exception more than the rule for the most part people are extremely cool and they just want to have a good time and want to see a good show you know well thank god for that <laughs> yeah yeah and uh before we move on to the last couple of questions future plans between federally and bgm what can you share with us you know i don't I don't have any plans right now um for any sort of a collaboration i i, I talk to anton occasionally um and, you know, I've thought about maybe having him sing on a song of mine at some point. So maybe that's the thing that could happen. But I don't have anything, like, specifically in the works right now. Um, I think that'd be a neat thing to explore, though. Mm -hmm. It definitely would. It definitely would. Yeah. yeah. When, very early days, I know, but when can we expect the next album you're working on? Well, I'm hoping to get it done over the course of this winter. I'm actually in the middle of moving my recording studio right now. Um, you actually... Uh, Caught me at Home Depot. I'm at Home Depot right now buying stuff for my new studio that I'm building. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> buying lumber. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I've got seven songs, like, started. A couple of them, I'd say, are pretty close to done as far as, like, all the overdubs and um, the mixings getting there. Um, so once I record, like, two or three more, um, I'd say over the course of the winter, I could probably get it done and hopefully have a release, you know? middle of next year something like that very cool very cool i have to say it's a first for the podcast now an interview in home depot <laughs> <laughs> i'm in home depot yes it's uh not not what I, how i would have chosen it but actually it's been pretty fun thanks yeah, for yeah. Thanks, thanks for being flexible with me sorry <laughs> no worries i'll uh, just quickly jump on to the last couple there are a couple of fun random ones okay great first off besides music what are you currently obsessed with Oh, um, not music related whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I really, I really love cooking. So I've really gotten into cooking. Um, and I, you know, it's summer, summer's winding down. So I've been trying to get as much outdoor cooking going as, as I can. So I've been doing a lot of barbecuing, um, and just, trying to make the most delicious food i possibly can <laughs> that's kind of like my main thing outside of music i guess you could say i like it i like it the next one is a bit odd if you had to spend 24 hours locked in a room with any musician from history who would it be Ooh, um locked in a room you have to take their personality into account there um yep <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I would probably have to say I would probably have to say Jimi Hendrix because I am just so fascinated by his guitar abilities and his uh persona. 
I've always just been fascinated by Jimi Hendrix. I, I just love to ask him, how on earth did you make these sounds with your guitar? <laughs> get, get some lessons, you know? I'd like to learn a couple yeah. things. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Teach me some stuff, man. Exactly, exactly. The final question, so what is your go-to album? An album you constantly revisit. Ooh. Goodness gracious. Tough one. Um, well, I would have to say for me, it's probably my favorite record. It's it's also what I named my recording studio after, but um, the Beatles Revolver. Um, I, I just love that record. There's something magical about that record. And I think it also is the thing about it that I like, especially aside from the great songs, is uh, that's when they really start taking their production um, and making that part of the songwriting process. And they started really experimenting and using the studio as an instrument. And, and I'm really into that, interested in that. And um, I think it's like kind of one of the first times that people tried to do that in earnest, um, at least in the context of rock music. So the, I would have to say the Beatles Revolver. Absolutely perfect choice. I love that one myself. Listen, Colin, this has been a hell of a lot of fun now. Thanks a million. You got it. Thank you.
guys. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So, until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing there? The show's over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. Bye.